Hello once again to the coronavirus daily. I know, I know, I've slowed down with this analysis so much that maybe it is time to drop the word daily from the name. Well, I'll see to that, but for the moment, I am Ajay Punya, and through this series, I help you better understand where the world stands with regards to the coronavirus pandemic. I try to carefully analyze all the info around the way forward during and after the pandemic and simplify it to bring to you. My original intention was to do it daily, but now my lockdown lazy bum refuses to do the analysis daily. So here I am in the middle of the virus, still wreaking havoc, not just on the economies of countries, but also to our minds as well. Prime examples being some of India's leading business persons from Kiran Mazumdar Shah's Twitter meltdown. To Narayan Murthy's 60-hour work week for the next couple of years in the interest of economy building. I hope he really wanted to say 60 hours per week with salaries increased on a pro rata basis. But Uncle Ji thinks poor people are poor since they're lazy. Hey, now you're getting personal. Oh, by the way, they think alike. The day today is 2nd May. I know it's not a Sunday, but being in what seems like an infinite lockdown loop, every day feels like a Sunday. Yeah, that was my adaptation of WHO's regional director, Takeshi Kasai's suggestion to get ready for a new way of living till vaccine is available. Today, I've done a deep dive on a couple of topics, so it's a rather long episode that doesn't follow the usual discipline of good, bad, and ugly. So, you can move on to the kitchen, start with some cooking, or perhaps uh, do the dishes and listen to me while I explain. As the twilight of 40-day lockdown years, let's talk about opening up or ending the lockdown. Who am I kidding? The lockdown continues for another two weeks. Anyway, so if you're from Sweden and watching this, you can skip to a few minutes ahead. But if not, follow me. If you can get people to wear masks, implement social distancing and ban gatherings over, say, 50 or 100 people, can you keep R not less than zero? Uh, can you keep R not less than one with robust testing and contact tracing? And R not of less than one is desirable because that would mean each person cannot infect more than one person, and thus the spread remains controlled and the economy doesn't have to go through the repeated open and shut cycle. In this pre-vaccine times, without adequate testing, you're running a sizable risk day after day of another large outbreak you don't catch until it's too late. Just like Singapore. Please note, when I say tests, I mean both RT-PCR as well as antibody tests. You can watch episode 13 to understand the distinction and the importance of both. Now, why Singapore? Like South Korea and Taiwan, Singapore was one of the ongoing case studies of how to manage the outbreak. Through robust testing, tracing, and isolations, they managed very well until the inevitable, a fresh wave. In two months, till March 23, Singapore had only 500 cases every day. How did that happen? Before I answer, I'll digress a bit here. So understanding what opening up can lead to is important. Singapore had a blind spot in their aggressive contact tracing strategy. It's migrant workers. Does it ring a bell? Do you now realize the importance of talking about Singapore? For the uninitiated, after struggling to manage them, the Indian government recently allowed migrant workers to go back home. They started buses and trains. You would have read that in the news. Now, coming back to Singapore, a lot of these migrant workers, majority of whom hail from South Asia, live in dormitories of 12 to 20, where social distancing is next to impossible. And thus, COVID-19 has made its way into these dorms, leading to Singapore losing control of the outbreak with as much as 80% of daily cases attributed to migrants. And last week, they announced a circuit breaker lockdown till June 1. Singapore is thus a strong cautionary lesson in the problem with ignoring marginalized communities during a health crisis. Back home in India, we have gotten some control over the virus only through the sacrifice of the people 
and we shouldn't waste that sacrifice. The lockdown is a drug, except that it gives one a false sense of control. Although all that it does is just delay the impact. But the longer you lock down without even realizing, your strategy starts chipping from the edges. The economic burden of a hungry and fatigued population takes over. Lockdown does not, does not eliminate the virus. Now, individually, we should all protect ourselves, maintain healthy habits, and together, we should build on it. So I thought it would be a good idea to look at how schools, which, by the way, have done a super job of pivoting to taking classes online, I mean, wherever possible, can implement safe practices. Talking about schools is important because if kids don't go to school, parents can't go to work, and the opening up remains on paper. Hmm. So what options do schools have post-corona? Doubling buses on, this, on, some, on the same routes to ensure distancing. But there is driver shortage and support staff shortage if the migrants don't come back. What else? Um, more classrooms, but since infrastructure can't be developed on a short notice, perhaps longer school hours on alternate days. In schools where students change rooms for classes, will teachers do that? But chemistry labs don't have legs, so... This reconfiguring of schedule would be like playing chess if it wasn't already. For higher classes with elective subjects, the, teach the teacher moving scenario may not work. So perhaps some of those classes are taken online and thus by expansion. Can schools partly work online? Masks, hand washing, temperature checks for both teachers as well as students and admin staff as well. Thus more custodians, more admin staff, and what would all of this mean together? More expensive education. No shit, Sherlock. Let's take another example. Retail stores, which are allowed to open up in this graded lockdown 3.0. So what changes would they adopt? In the last few years, since e-commerce picked up, retail stores have pitched the experience of being, a, being in a store and trying on before finally deciding what one would like to buy. But now, it is the very same experience that puts the customer at risk. And so, they would need to innovate further. Employees and customers wearing masks, that is obvious. Constant in-store reminders for shoppers to maintain distance. But does that mean no shopping with family or friends? Sanitizers near elevators and escalators. Cleaning fresh arrivals to ensure they are virus-free. Exchange or returns, maybe not, or perhaps the policy of return goods kept off sales section for at least 24 hours. Trials or fitting rooms, forget about it. So maybe something like digital try-ons by augmented reality, like they did in Jetsons once. So essentially, a retail store has to act like it isn't a retail store in order to be open. That's kind of like saying closed in it. And each one of you who think it's stupid to be a nudist, guess who's laughing now? Here's some good news though. For quite some time, the world was freaking out with South Korea's reports of reinfection and recovered patients. The news that I have brought today is very, very encouraging. The thing with RT-PCR RT tests is that it cannot distinguish between a dead virus and an alive virus. So these reinfection reports were all false positives. The fragments of dead virus cells can take months to clear from recovered patients. And before you think, how can Korean Center for Disease Control be so sure that all these reinfection reporting 250 plus people are carrying dead virus? I'll answer. Before they arrived at the dead virus conclusion, the committee found that these relapse patients appear to have little or no contagiousness. However, however. There is a difference between disproving reinfection and proving past infection provides immunity. The research for this is on in the meanwhile. Remember, absence of evidence does not mean evidence of absence. I'll babble some more about the same topic. At this point, you must be thinking, instead of scaring people with false tests, there has got to be a better testing protocol. See, the virus mutates, although not by too much, as I mentioned in one of the earlier episodes. So, the virus mutates, but the tests remain standard. False positives are bound to happen. So, perhaps we need something as accurate as a pregnancy test. Sure, we do. 
but pregnancy tests react to the same old well known hormone every time and thus are easily optimized so in closing i'll just say that we still don't know how long the immunity lasts and with less than half a dozen months into the pandemic there is no way to know the bad so in the last episode i spoke of what are the various kinds of vaccines that are currently under works we heard various experts talk about expecting vaccines in 12 to 18 months so i thought it'll be a good time to speak about what are the various stages of development of a vaccine and why you should be wary of business people talking about finding a vaccine and it's music to their investors and shareholders although vaccine is the best route back to normal life and has the potential to stop outbreaks before they run amok i don't think we should live and swear by this vaccine romanticism we can't just stay in permanent lockdown and wait for a vaccine that is highly irresponsible but nevertheless getting the vaccine is still important to stop living in a permanent state of fear a vaccine is the end result of years of discovery and development clinical trials almost never succeed a very small percentage of candidate vaccines actually make their way to licensing thus making the cost of vaccine development high but at this stage as bill gates told trevor no all let's keep the cost aspects aside development of vaccines can be simplified into two broad categories preclinical development and clinical development preclinical development which is the research carried out in lab assays and on animals it includes intense research for identification of relevant antigens that will help beat in this case the virus creation of a vaccine concept evaluation of vaccine efficacy in test tube and animals a side note many candidate vaccines don't move on to the next stage of development because they fail to produce that immunity or prove harmful to these test subjects and manufacture of the vaccine and submitting it to regulatory bodies like the US FDA for clinical trials now clinical development when the vaccine is first tested in humans it covers four stages over several years Stage 1 initial small scale clinical trials in less than 100 volunteers to assess whether the vaccine is safe and what immune response it evokes why volunteers because vaccine development is risky business and so ethics come into play stage 2 larger clinical trials with hundreds of volunteers mainly to assess the efficacy of the vaccine against artificial infection and clinical disease in this stage side effects immunization schedule and dose size are also studied stage 3 a large scale of thousands of subjects across several places to evaluate efficacy under natural disease conditions because sometimes rare side effects don't appear in smaller groups if everything is fine then the manufacturer applies for license stage 4 when the vaccine has been licensed and introduced into use the stage aims to detect rare adverse effects as well as to assess long term efficacy collectively the clinical trials can take years university of oxford that is one of the 90 plus entities globally working to create a vaccine did its pre clinical trials in march and began clinical trials last week they say by mid june uh, they will be in a position to see if their vaccine is working in humans curevax vaccine that uses only one microgram of uh, messenger rna meaning that it can be mass produced easily goes into clinical trials in june we can have multiple vaccines for the same disease i'll talk about it in a bit interestingly us has been celebrating moderna which had an early prospect ready for clinical trials just 42 days after the genetic sequence for the new coronavirus was released but the truth is the biotechnology underlying this drug has existed for nearly 30 years and it has never yielded a working vaccine for any human disease So clinical development is built on rigorous ethical principles of informed consent from volunteers with an emphasis on vaccine safety as well as efficacy although there is another stage after licensing and manufacturing and that is quality control wherein manufacturers must adhere to procedures that allow authorities to track whether a vaccine is performing as anticipated following these conventional ways means there is no chance of having a vaccine in 18 months and so the solution a pandemic will require pandemic speed of approvals couple of days ago the new york times had a wonderful interactive article about how long the coronavirus vaccine will take 
you'll find the link to that and everything else that I talk about in the link in, in below. But before I draw some outlines about coronavirus vaccine vis-a-vis -vis the stages I described above, just a little understanding of the learnings of finding vaccines in times of an ongoing crisis. Drug makers are often incentivized to move faster in the face of epidemics because the payoff for cracking the code to a blockbuster vaccine can be enormous. Although, in the case of COVID-19, due to public health crisis, this incentive may not be so much. The rush to develop a vaccine in response to an outbreak, however, can threaten that region's ability to counteract existing health threats. For example, in West Africa during Ebola, existing immunization resources from communities that were at risk were diverted for other serious conditions for which vaccines already existed. And due to already poor healthcare infrastructure, there were many more deaths from malaria, many more deaths from, from pneumonia, uh, diarrhea and non-Ebola causes because of the absolute disruption of the healthcare system. Right. So now let's try to fit this understanding in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. First things first, the world has never seen a coronavirus vaccine for humans before. Never have we ever. SARS fizzled out faster than a vaccine could make its way through clinical trials and MERS created too few cases to generate sustained funding for developers. Following through these clinical trial phases is very important because some preliminary vaccines for the coronavirus have actually enhanced the disease in model experiments. Work with the SARS virus showed that worrying immune responses were seen in ferrets and monkeys, but not in mice. Okay, do you know the fastest ever approved vaccine ever? The answer is mumps. It's the mumps vaccine. It took four years to go into licensing in 1967. For comparison, rotavirus vaccine that prevents diarrhea took 15 years. Varicella vaccine that prevents chickenpox took 28 years. If it weren't obvious already, let me state it clearly. It is very, very important to not cut corners in vaccine development. As Trump said, although in a very different context, the cure cannot be worse than the problem. We need to be very sure that the vaccine is safe and potent, especially when transmission rates are high and the spread is difficult to track. Back to COVID-19. In the search for COVID-19 vaccine, due to SARS and MERS, there was already a fair bit of research kept on the table. And that is why the RT-PCR test was developed so quickly. It is believed that the stages of clinical trials will be combined to achieve pandemic speeds and reduce the time to arrive at the final stage. However, finding volunteers, people willing to get themselves injected with something unknown, is an idea that sounds easy in theory but isn't quite so in practice. So let's account for some time for that, for stages 2 and 3, unless some arm-twisting ways are used. If a vaccine proves successful in early trials, we can have a vaccine ready for emergency use by healthcare workers as early as September, like what the Oxford University researchers announced. Development understood? Let's fast forward to say we have the vaccine. So who will get it first? To put it simply, the best way to develop the COVID-19 vaccine may determine how much it will cost to make the drug and by extension, who can afford it. Also. Since the presence of virus somewhere means the virus can be anywhere, it needs to be ensured that the world's poorest people do not get ignored. A global access agreement might also lead to creation of more than one COVID-19 vaccine, each effective but with different prices for different markets. Such a setup has happened in the past for pneumococcal and human papilloma virus vaccines, HPV vaccines. That protect us from the pneumonia and uh, meningitis and various types of cancers, respectively. Globally, our best bet is that the vaccine manufacturers worldwide will get a quick license so that everyone everywhere in the world can get vaccinated. The scope for producing billions of vaccines alongside the existing ones is an undertaking almost unimaginable. And that's just the vaccines. What about the vials in which they are stored and shipped? Billions of those would have to be needed and billions of stoppers to seal them in and storage and trucks and every bit of the supply chain mechanism. So personally, in matters as sensitive as injecting a foreign item, one may think it's a good idea to not be the first one to get the vaccine. You know, just in case there are some 
unexpected problems, especially when a lot of trials were fast-tracked, involving greedy agents, corruptible people, and all kinds of hungry hyenas. That's all for today. Uh, if you like the episode, please do subscribe to the channel and share this video. Goodbye, wash your hands, and see you then.